there was a knock on the door. Hanchard opened it and found a well-built, friendly-looking man on the doorstep with a foreign, unfamiliar air about him. Hanchard nodded, good morning, after asking if he was talking to Mr. Hanchard. The man introduced himself. He said his name was Nilsson. Hanchard's face and eyes seemed to die. I know the name well, he said at last. I am sure you do, replied the visitor. Well, the fact is I have been looking for you for the last fortnight. I landed at Heavenpool and went to Felmouth. And when I got there, they told me you were living in Castor Bridge. Back I came again and I got here by coach ten minutes ago. He lives down by the mill, they told me. So here I am. Now, what happened between us some twenty years ago? That's what I have called about. It was a curious business. I was younger than, than I am now. And perhaps the less said about it, in one sense, the better. Curious business. It was worse than that. I cannot even accept that I am the man you met then. I was not in my senses, and a man's senses are himself. We were young and thoughtless, said Nelson. However, I haven't come here to argue with you. Poor Susan, hers was a strange experience. I hope she would be happy with me. She was, I think, your child died. She had another, and all went well, but a time came when somebody told her that our life together was wrong. After that, she was always uneasy. She said she must leave me, and then came the question of our child. Then I left her at fell mouth and went off to sea. When I got to the other side of the Atlantic, there was a storm, and it was thought that I had been drawn I got ashore in Newfoundland. And then I asked myself what I should do. Since I am here, I'll stay here. I thought to myself, it will be kinder to her to let her think that I am dead. For while she thinks I am alive, she'll be miserable. If she thinks I am dead, she'll go back to him. I thought, and the child will have a home. I did not come back to this country until a month ago, and they told me in Felmouth that Susan was dead. But where is my Elizabeth Jane? Dead also, said Hanchard coldly. Surely you learned that too. The sailor was shocked. Dead? He said in a low voice. Hanchard, without answering, nodded his head. Where is she buried? the traveller asked. By her mother, said Hanchard, in the same cold tone. When did she die? A year ago and more. There was no hesitation in Hanchard's answer. The sailor stood there silently for a while and then said, My journey here has been for nothing. I may as well go as I came. It has served me right. I will not trouble you any longer, and turning, he walked away. Hanchard slowly closed the door. He could hardly believe what he had done, but surely Nusen would soon find out his lies. The townspeople would tell him he would come back and curse him and take Elizabeth Jean away. He hastily put on his hat and went out in the direction Nusen had taken. He soon saw him in the distance, walking up the road. Hanchard followed. Then he saw the sailor get into the morning coach, which had dropped him earlier, and was still standing outside the king's arms. A moment later, the coach left. Nielsen had not for a single moment doubted what Hanchard had told him. But for how long would he believe it's someone? 
someone who knew Casterbridge would soon tell him the truth, and back he would come to claim his Elizabeth Jane. Hanchard could not bear the thought. He returned to the house, half expecting that she would have vanished. No, there she was, just coming out of the inner room. The marks of sleep still on her. Oh, father, she said, smiling. I have slept so long. I am glad. He said, taking her hand with anxious care and act which gave her a pleasant surprise. Father, she said as they sat down to breakfast. It is so kind of you to get this nice breakfast with your own hands. And I have been asleep all the time. I do it every day, he replied. You have left me. Everybody has left me. I do everything for myself now. You are very lonely, aren't you? Yes, child. You cannot know how lonely, but it is my own fault. You are the only one who has been near me for weeks and you will soon not come here any more. He was quite certain Nelson would return at any moment and claim Elizabeth Jane. He would soon hate him for what he had done and said. At this moment, Hancher thought to himself, her heart is as warm towards me as mine towards her. Yet before the day is over, she will probably hate me. Susan, Farfrey, Lucetta, Elizabeth Jane, all had gone from him, one after the other, either by his own fault or by misfortune. In place of them, he had no interest or desire. The whole land ahead of him was darkness itself. There was nothing to come, nothing to wait for, yet in the natural course of life he might go on living another thirty or forty years, scorned by all, or at best pitied. The thought of it was unbearable, but to his surprise, later in the day, Elizabeth Jane returned. She came forward, spoke, called him father, just as before. Nelson then had not yet learned the truth. I thought you seemed very sad earlier, she said. Everybody and everything seems to be against you. And I know you must be suffering, father. I will not leave you alone. She cried, may I live with you and look after you? If only you would, he cried. But how can you forgive all my roughness in former days? You cannot. I have forgotten it. Talk of that no more. Time passed and it seemed as though fate was being more kind and gentle to Michael Henchard than formerly. The town council offered him a small seed and root shop to help him make a new star. The shop was next to the churchyard and Elizabeth Jane came to live with him there. They seldom went out and never on a market day. They saw Donald Farfrey only at rare intervals and then mostly as a distant figure on the street. Time was teaching Farfrey too how to return to life on his own without Lucetta. He became interested in his business again. By the end of the year, Hancher's little seed shop, not much larger than a cupboard, was doing well. The stepfather and daughter enjoyed much peace in the pleasure sunny corner in which it stood. Elizabeth Jane had her own way in everything now. Hancher did all that he could for her. He never forgot that a wanderer Nelson could still return and take away the only thing he held dear. Elizabeth Jane enjoyed walking along the Budmouth Road and looking down on the sea from there. One spring day, while she was out on one of these walks, Hancher paused by her empty room. 
He recalled the time she had left his house in Corn Street. He looked in. The present room was much more humble, but what struck him was the number of books everywhere. Surely she could not have bought them all herself. The incident left him puzzled and rather uneasy, and he thought he would speak to Elizabeth Jane about it. But before he had found the courage to speak, another event occurred to fuel his jealous nature. The busy time of the sea trade was over, and Henchard, having nothing better to do, walked up towards the marketplace. Farfrae was standing a few steps from the door of his house and looking thoughtfully at something. Henchard saw that what attracted Farfrae's look was Elizabeth Jane, who on her part seemed not to have noticed Farfrae's attention. Henchard turned away quickly, deeply troubled. He hated what he had seen. The thought of a possible separation brought about by Farfrae's renewed interest was more than he could bear. That evening he could not keep silent. Have you seen Mr. Farfrae today, Elizabeth Jane? He asked suspense in his voice. Elizabeth Jane started at the question, and it was with some confusion that she replied, No. Oh, that's all right. That's all right. It was only that I saw him in the street when we both were there. He noticed her embarrassment and wondered if her long box and new books had anything to do with the young man. He decided that he must watch Elizabeth Jane more carefully. There was nothing secret about Elizabeth Jane's movements, and it may at once be said that when she and Donald did meet by chance, she did talk to him. Whatever the reason for her walks along the Budmouth Road, her return from those walks often happened at the time when Farfrae was coming out for a 20 minutes walk just to clear his head after the day's business and before sitting down to tea. By secretly watching, Hanchard soon learned of these meetings and was full of jealous grief. He means to rob me of her too, he whispered, but he has the right. I should perhaps not interfere. If she had lost her heart to any other man in the world than the one he had rivaled, cursed, fought with for life, Henchard would have said, I am content. But he could not be content with this. He knew that if they married, he and Elizabeth Jane would grow to be strangers, and the end of his life would pass friendless and alone. Henchard became more moody. His health began to suffer. He started to spy on Elizabeth Jane from an upper room in the house, using an old telescope to watch the Budmouth Road. One day, Henchard was up there, ready to watch, when a stranger appeared on the road coming from Budmouth. Henchard raised the telescope and froze with horror. The figure that sprang up before him was nuisance. Henchard dropped the telescope and for some moments made no other movement. Presently from downstairs, he heard Elizabeth Jane moving about and realized that she could not yet have met her father. He knew he could no longer remain in Kester Bridge with Nielsen about to appear. He went downstairs. I am going to leave Kester Bridge, Elizabeth Jane. Leave Kester Bridge? She cried. And leave me? Yes, this little shop can be managed by you alone as well as by us both. I don't care about shops and streets and people. I would rather get into the country by myself, out of sight and follow my own pace and leave you to yours. She looked down and her tears fell silently. It seemed to her it must be because of her meetings with Donald Farfrae. She knew he had learned of them, though they had never spoken of it.
I am sorry you have decided to do this, she said with difficulty. For I thought it probable, possible that I might marry Mr. Farfrae quite soon. And I did hope that you would not disapprove. I approve of anything you desire to do, Elizabeth Jane, said Henchard softly. But approving or not approving will make no difference. I just wish to go away. My presence might make things awkward in the future, and it is best that I go. Nothing that she could say or do would make him change his mind. Then she said at last, You will not be able to come to my wedding, and that is a pity. I don't want to see it. I don't want to see it, he exclaimed, adding more softly. But think of me sometimes in your future life. You'll do that, Elizabeth Jane. Think of me when you are living as the wife of the richest, most important man in the town. Don't let my sins, when you know them all, cause you quite to forget that though I loved you late, I loved you well. It is because of Donald, she began to cry. I don't forbid you to marry him, said Henchard. Promise not to quite forget me. When? He meant when Newson should come. She promised tearfully, and Henchard, satisfied, got himself ready to leave. He bought a new tool basket, cleaned up his old hay knife, and bought new cord breeches and a corduroy jacket, putting aside forever the old and worn out gentleman's suit that he had always worn since his fall. He left Casterbridge that same evening, going secretly from the town, where he had gained so much and then lost so much. Elizabeth Jane walked out with him a little way and parted with him sorrowfully, keeping him back a minute or two before finally letting him go. She watched his figure grow smaller in the distance, though she did not know it. Henchard formed much the same picture as he had when entering Kester Bridge for the first time nearly a quarter of a century before. With the rush basket on his back and the tools showing at the top, only age had changed him, had lessened the spring in his walk and bent his back lower. Elizabeth Jane turned with a sigh towards Kester Bridge. Before she had reached the first house, she was met by Donald Farfrae. It was clearly not their first meeting that day. Has he gone? asked Farfrae anxiously. He has gone, Donald, she said sadly. But who is this person you earlier wanted me to meet? Well, dear, you'll know soon about that. They walked back together to Farfrae's house. Farfrae flung open the door of the sitting room, saying, There he is waiting for you. And Elizabeth Jane entered. In the armchair sat Richard Newson. Her meeting with the light-hearted father, from whom she had been separated half a dozen years, as if by death, need hardly be detailed. Hancher's departure was in a moment explained when the true facts about her relationship to Henchard came out. Elizabeth Jane believed them for Henchard's behavior itself was proof that those facts were true. Newson's pride in what she had grown up to be was more than he could put into words. He kissed her lovingly again and again. He then told them how nine or ten months previously he had spoken to Henchard about Elizabeth Jane and how Henchard had said she had died a year before. Nelson, who was never a bitter or angry man, said he thought it was rather a good joke. But Elizabeth Jane was amazed that Henchard could have done such a thing. A joke? Oh no, she cried. Then he kept you from me, father, all those months when you might have been here. The father admitted that that was the case. 
he ought not to have done it, said Farfrae. Elizabeth Jane sighed. I said I would never forget him, but oh, I think I ought to forget him now. Well, Newson said, taking Hancher's part a little, he hardly said ten words after all. And how could he know that I should be so silly as to believe him? It was my fault as much as his poor fellow. No, said Elizabeth Jane firmly. He knew what you were like. You were always so trusting, father. I heard my mother say so hundreds of times, and he did it to wrong you. After pretending to me for five years, he was my father. He should not have done this. Well, never mind. It is all over and past, said Newson. Now let's go on with the plans for your wedding.